Hello. Um, today uh, we are doing, I think, our third uh, English live stream. Um, I am doing interviews and live streams with uh, philosophers from around the world. Um, our first guest was uh, Graham Opie, and we talked about naturalism as well. And today we are also going to talk about also physicalism and naturalism with Dr. Uh, David Papineau. Welcome. Um, so, Thank you, Barrett. I'm very glad to be here. Yeah, uh, I conducted an interview with uh, Dr. Papineau uh, before for Öncül about uh, also naturalism, but today I think we are going to be, uh, it is going to be more detailed than the before. Mm -hmm. So, um, firstly, uh, could you briefly introduce yourself to, for our audience? Okay, I'm David Papineau. I'm, my full title is I'm Professor of Philosophy of Natural Science at King's College London. Uh, I do work in philosophy of science, but I work in a lot of other areas of philosophy as well, I guess... I'd say I do a lot of metaphysics and philosophy of mind uh, and some work on uh, philosophy of biology, philosophy of mathematics, uh, epistemology. So quite wide ranging. Uh, yeah. I've written a few books. My most recent is on the philosophy of perception. It's called The Metaphysics of Metaphysics. Sensory Experience. Good. Is that so, enough? Is, is that yeah, enough? Yeah. It, it, it is enough, yeah. So you you are I think also interested in philosophy of sports. Yes, yes. I well, I got interested in writing about philosophical aspects of sport and uh, and ways in which sporting activities can uh, be philosophically interesting. But about ten years ago, and I had a blog, and that was a lot of fun. And then I put the the blog post together in a book, uh, yeah. 2017, Knowing the Score. Uh, yeah. I'm not really working on that as such anymore. That was kind of, a lot of fun, yeah. but uh, it's kind yeah. of... It seems like a side project for you, right? Yeah, but but uh, some, now and then I come back to it. In fact, the New York Times yeah. asked mm. me to write something about the World Cup last last couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I wrote a thing about... about uh, diving and faking injuries and uh, morality yeah. and fiction. that was fun. Did, did, did you see it, Barrett? Did, did I didn't, but uh, I didn't because I'm not a huge football fan, but uh -huh. uh, I, I will see it. Okay. okay. So um, our topic today is physicalism and naturalism. Um, which one should we start? Oh, well, Probably I think we should start with physicalism. Yeah. Yeah, I think perhaps we should start with really Na naturalism. Okay. It's more. It's more wide ranging more, in a way. More general. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, the that's true. Uh, yes. Let me. So uh, before starting with them, actually, uh, I want to ask you something about definitions uh, in general. Like, yeah. uh, do you think definitional definitional disputes are meaningful or they are just shallow? Just say what you accept already and we go through it and not uh, argue about what is uh, naturalism or what is physicalism because these are uh, meaningless disputes, many claim. Uh, do you think uh, there are some... I think, I, think uh, def yeah. I think definitional disputes... Well, definitional disputes. I mean, who wants to? I, 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 I find my... If it turns out a dispute is just definitional, that means to me it's not very interesting. We're doing philosophy here. We're not arguing about what words mean. I mean, uh, you can just specify what your words mean and get on with doing philosophy. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, people sometimes a, accuse each other uh, about not being naturalistic about uh, uh, enough, right? Uh, yes, but the. I think naturalism, arguing about the meaning of naturalism, is clearly silly. I mean, look, yeah. 
we might argue about the meaning of the moon, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, what the moon? moon. The moon's a perfectly clear term. Everybody knows what it means. It's not ambiguous. It's got a very clear. Uh, 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 what it refers to is absolutely straightforward. So, but but naturalism, naturalism is a term of art. I mean, it's a technical yeah. term within analytic philosophy, and it's a term used outside analytic philosophy with all kinds of different meanings. And uh, so, there's no point in, in arguing about what does naturalism really mean. Uh, even within analytic philosophy, different people use the term in different ways. I mean, I had to write some things about naturalism, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. And I started off thinking, well, let's, let's, let's get, let's, you know, first of all, uh, uh, get clear about what the, what the correct meaning of naturalism is. And I realized that was just hopeless. I mean, I was getting nowhere trying to write like that. And because lots of different philosophers use naturalism in different ways. In large part, because nearly all analytic philosophers, I mean, this is a bit of a generalization, but the vast majority don't want to be counted as non-naturalists. They want to mm -hmm. be naturalists. But that covers an awful lot of different views, an awful lot of different philosophers want to be naturalist and some are more naturalist than others and yeah. the ones who uh, are less naturalist want to set the bar for naturalism very low so john mcdowell wants to say he's a naturalist david chalmers wants to say he's a naturalist everybody wants to be a naturalist and if you want to get a definition that will include say uh john mcdowell and daniel dennett it's quite hard so uh yeah. uh I don't think we should even start thinking about what the word naturalism, how it should properly be used, either in philosophy or outside philosophy. So, all right, we might seem to have a problem now. How are we going to discuss it? Look, let's just go ahead and discuss it and yeah. not worry about what it means. Uh, my, so my own view is, 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 is that there's a whole... The, there's a lot of issues in philosophy. There's... Uh, mm -hmm. There's, you know, is the mind separate from the brain? Uh, is everything physical? Uh, what is moral value? And so on, all kinds of issues. And, and we can debate them. And, and even if naturalism isn't a clearly defined term, it's not so hard to classify answers yeah. to those questions as more or less naturalist. Mm -hmm. And and what one should be interested in is, is, are there good arguments pushing you into what might loosely be called a naturalist direction? It's the arguments that are interesting, not, not the, the definition of the positions. So maybe we, we might ask you how you use naturalism in your writing. Look, I... I I think it's very useful to distinguish two quite different kinds of naturalism in analytic philosophy. And uh, this division, I, I, I don't know if I started it. It's in, it's in my Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on naturalism. I distinguish quite clearly between, between ontological naturalism and methodological naturalism. These are two different aspects of analytic philosophy. So ontological naturalism is roughly physicalism. Uh, there isn't anything in reality that isn't grounded in physics. There's nothing over and above the physical. There are no supernatural uh, 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 agents. There's uh, no events happen except uh, governed by natural law and so on. So that, that that's about... Nothing supernatural in reality. That's that's one view. Uh, ontological naturalism. It's about the nature of of reality. We I mean, we we might talk about that a lot lot more in a mm -hmm. bit. The other view in in analytic philosophy is methodological naturalism, and this isn't a view about what's in reality. This is a, a metaphilosophical view, 
about the nature of philosophy, what philosophy is, or at least what philosophy ought to be. And methodological naturalists think that uh, uh, philosophy should be like science, that there's no big division between philosophy and science. Uh, they're definitely against the idea that uh, uh, philosophy is a matter of analyzing concept, where science is a matter of investigating facts. Uh, methodological naturalists are also against the idea that philosophy has some kind of special a priori access to reality. Uh, uh, the, the methodological naturalists think philosophy is very much like science. I mean, the, the, the challenge then is to explain, well, it's not exactly like science, obviously. I mean, they're different departments. People behave in different ways. What's the difference then? But, but uh, the, the, the general line of methodological naturalism is philosophy. It's akin to science. And the two strands in naturalism are pretty independent. I mean, you could be uh, denying methodological naturalism, says philosophy has some special kind of, of investigative methods, but end up being an ontological naturalist, thinking that there's nothing over and above the physical realm, and vice versa. You could, you could uh, I think philosophy is just like science, but end up thinking there's good reason to believe in non-physical mind, say. So, uh, uh, so methodological naturalism is about how to do philosophy, what's, what's the right philosophical method, and ontological naturalism is uh, no supernatural beings, um, it's all physical. Uh, and Perhaps I should add one little, one little thing in case anybody's confused. In the philosophy of religion, there's a debate in which methodological naturalism has a different meaning again. And uh, it's, it's basically the idea that even if you are a believer, you can practice science just like any other scientist. In, in, uh, in the philosophy of religion, uh, that's a view about the interaction between religion and science, that science is independent of religion. Methodological naturalism there is a view that science is independent of religion. So that's a view about science and religion. It's, it's, not, it's not to do with philosophy. Yeah. Uh, 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 my methodological naturalism or, or analytic philosophy's methodological naturalism is a view about how to do philosophy. Yeah, uh, and you can, for example, be a metaphilosophical naturalist even though you are a theist, technically, right? Usually they are not the, uh, theists, I think, methodolog methodological naturalists, but it, it seems compatible to me. Uh, may maybe there's some tension, but... Yes, well, 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 quite. That's an interesting, interesting case. Uh, I mean, if you're a theist and you do philosophy, you're a philosopher of religion, you might you might start thinking about the epistemology of uh, religious claims and yeah. and one position is natural theology that there are good scientific arguments. Yeah. Or yeah. believing in uh, they are uh, usually empirical arguments. So uh, I mean, you can think, yeah. think, think of. Uh, well, I mean, there's a strong tradition of natural theology. I mean, Paley yeah. arguing from design. Look, all the animals around you can see a design. Uh, therefore, there must have been a creator. I mean, that, that's a, a scientific argument for, yeah. for theistic conclusion. Uh, so, yeah, uh, interesting. I've never thought of that. But yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, physicalism is just ontological naturalism. So uh, we should discuss uh, it under naturalism, not mm -hmm. uh, outside of it, I think. So yeah. um, I think most of our viewers are interested in uh, ontological naturalism. So uh, could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Okay. Uh, Let's take it to the be the view that there's nothing over and above the physical realm. Now, one might hear that and understand it in what Daniel Dennett calls a greedy reductionist way. Okay, mm -hmm. so now we're going to give a physical definition of uh, uh, 
uh, a human being or physical definition of kindness or a physical definition of uh, economic inflation. Take it. Take any any uh, uh, concept you take seriously. We'll, we'll, we'll analyze it physically, and that's that's sometimes called reductive physicalism, and that's not a very popular view because uh, we might wonder whether this is a matter of principle or a matter of practice. But but clearly, there's there, there's no point in trying to uh, specify in physical terms in terms of the movement of atoms what's required to get economic inflation in a certain country. Mm -hmm. So that's that's greedy physicalism, reductive physicalism, but most most uh, physicalists are, are non-reductive physicalists. They say uh, our physicalism consists in, in the thought that once you fix the physical facts, you fixed all the facts, uh, mm -hmm. but that leaves it open that it might be either for reasons of practical difficulty or reasons of principle that that you can't give a precise definition in physical terms of what it takes to be an economy with with monetary inflation I mean, mm -hmm. Kripke has this wonderful wonderful metaphor wonderful thought experiment to, to illustrate the doctrine of of uh, physicalism understood uh non-reductively. Uh, he says, imagine that, that God is making, making the universe. You know, he starts off, he makes the heaven and earth, and then he uh, makes the, the oceans and the weather, and then he, he, he makes the, the plants. And, and what he does is he puts all the, all the atoms and molecules in place. Everything physically required to create the universe he puts there. And now ask yourself the question, is God's work done? Can he, can he rest on the seventh day yet? And, and uh, non-physicalists will say, no, 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 there's a whole lot of stuff he hasn't put in yet. He hasn't put in, in particular, he hasn't put in uh, conscious minds. He hasn't put in uh, I mean, you, you might think they're, they're, they're more non-physical entities than those, but, but conscious minds is, is the obvious one. He hasn't put in the... He has to add the feelings. He has to add the consciousness. Uh, that's what, that's what non-physicalists will say. But a physicalist will say, no, no. Uh, once he's put all the atoms in place, he's there with created minds with consciousness. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there's nothing more to having... A human being uh, that's that's alive and sentient and conscious than having a human being physically arranged a certain way. Not even God could make a being who's physically just like me and leave out the consciousness. Once you put the molecules in place, you've made yeah. the consciousness. Yeah. So in, that's the physical. Yeah. In that case, uh, you're you're saying atoms is interesting because. If some conscious, uh, some facts about consciousness require historical facts, for example, uh, atoms might be same, but some, for example, intentional brain states might be of different meaning, right? Uh, if I, it is possible. Myself, I. He should fix historical facts as well. Well, yes. If if uh, myself, I'm not inclined to make consciousness depend on historical facts. I think mm -hmm. consciousness will, will be fixed by my physical yeah. facts, how they are now. But I am inclined to make meaningful facts, facts, yeah. facts to, mm -hmm. de to depend on historical facts. And that then has an interesting consequence. I'm not inclined to explain consciousness in terms of representation, in terms of yeah. intensity, because the latter... Yeah. Uh, is historically imbued and the former isn't. I mean, there are serious philosophers who want to explain consciousness in terms of representation. So th th this is an interesting, interesting yeah. issue. But we can bypass all that because uh, yeah. it's, I mean, the standard way of putting it is it's global supervenience. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all the physical facts uh, everywhere and every when, and then you fixed all the facts that there are. Uh, so the physicalist is allowed to, so to speak, help themselves to historical facts when they mm -hmm. need it. Okay, good. So um, 
there are usually three main uh, challenges to, I think, um, ontological uh, naturalism. Mm -hmm. uh, Hugh Price, I think, sa said that three M words, uh, M words, uh, morality, yes. meaning, and... Mathematics? Uh, ma mathematics, I think. But the, on, it the, might be mind as well. The, the, it might be mind, too. Uh, morality, meaning, mind, mathematics, yeah. modality. There's an awful lot of M yeah. words. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you're challenging me on the three M words, you better decide which ones you want to choose. Yeah. Um I think I think it's I, I think it's mind, yeah. meaning, and morality sounds like the right ones. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mind, meaning, and morality. Uh, for we, example, we, we can come back to, to, to mathematics and modality. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Uh, so uh starting with mind, uh the usual arguments for non physicalism about mind are Knowledge argument, zombie argument. I usually think them them as very weak. But uh, do you think there are better ways for arguing that uh, mind is non-physical, or these are just main arguments? Let me. I want to say something first before I yeah. think about what you just asked. Which is, it's not obvious to me that we should be starting with the arguments yeah. against physicalism rather yeah. than with the arguments for, for, for yeah for i think that, yeah so uh yes okay well the, 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 leave that up in the in the air you you asked me what are the strongest arguments for non-physicalism and i must say <laughs> i have put my mind to this question uh I don't think no. So the knowledge argument is no good by itself, as I see it. The knowledge argument and the zombie argument kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, uh, the knowledge argument forces us to recognize that uh, we at least have special ways of thinking about conscious mental states, that mm -hmm. even if conscious mental states are, are physical uh, at bottom in their, in their underlying nature, we M don't... Maybe we, we, don't we might say that, that, yeah. We, we, have, we might say that uh, there's a conceptual gap, but not an ontological gap. Right. So, so, we, so knowledge argument forces us to recognize that we have a special set of concepts that think about conscious states, loosely speaking, in terms of what they're like. We kind of recreate the conscious states in our imagination and think that kind of state. Uh, and now a physicalist will say, yeah, yeah, well, concepts are one thing, reality is another, and all the knowledge argument does is, is shows us that I mean, we, should we do the, the knowledge argument involves Mary? We, we, we may as well no. remember your, your, your... I think we don't need that, yeah. You know, but, but, but let, let, me, let me just fill it in because I, I, I need to talk about Mary a bit. So, so uh, uh, it's, uh, there's somebody who uh, knows all about uh, the physics and physiology and uh, optics and so on of color experience. Uh, she's an expert color scientist, but she's never seen any colors herself. Mary, she's lived in a black and white room all her life. And then she comes out and she sees the red rose. She has a new experience. And now she, uh, as Jackson says, knows what it's like to see rose, uh, to see, have an experience of something red when she didn't know what it was like before. And... Uh, and Jackson wants to say... This is a matter of knowledge. I mean, of course, everybody can agree she's had an experience that she had never had before. The physicalists will agree about that, but the physicalists will say that's no problem. Uh, she's had a brain state she's never had before. She's never been mm -hmm. uh, yeah. had her brain prompted by something, something out there that's red. Uh, but Jackson would say, no, it's, it's not just that she's had a new experience. She now knows something she didn't know before. Uh, uh, as he puts it, she knows what it's like to see something see something red and what the materialist the physicalist will say is mm, uh, i grant she's acquired now a new way of thinking 
about red experiences. She can recreate that experience in imagination now when she couldn't do that before. Uh, so she's got a new way of thinking about red experiences. But what she's thinking about is just the same uh, physical process. Let's suppose it's a certain kind of neural oscillation in the visual cortex in V4 that she used to think about when she was just an expert scientist in those terms, a certain kind of neural oscillation in V4. So her new her new concept, this experience, and now she kind of uh, uh, agitates Maybe. her brain in the right way, yeah. is just another way of thinking about neural oscillations in V4. So, so the knowledge argument only takes you to special phenomenal concepts not special phenomenal properties. Not it's, it's just like having two names for the same person. You might yeah. know that the, the you know you. Uh, uh, I knew that Cary Grant was born in Bristol, and now I learned that Archie Leach was born in Bristol. And uh, I might think you know I've learned about an extra person, but in truth, there's only one person there. I mean, Mary might confusedly be a dualist, but in truth. There's just one brain state that she's thinking about. So that's that's what the physicalist says to the knowledge argument. But then, and we can talk about the two-dimensional argument and the zombie argument and the conceivability possibility argument, but we can cut through a lot of that. Uh, it's really Martina Nida Rumelin and Philip Goff who showed us how to cut through. And and what all those arguments do is say sure uh in in many cases you can think about a single entity in two different ways uh and and one of the ways might well conceal its its real nature for you from you but phenomenal concepts aren't like that phenomenal concepts give you direct access to the uh, when I think about about a red experience by imagining what it's like, I'm I'm have it directly revealed to me the nature of the experience, and what's revealed to me is inter alia that it's not physical. I mean, if it was physical, I'd I'd kind of when thinking about it phenomenally, I'd see that it was physical, but I kind of see that it's not physical and. And so, so the the argument that in the end is supposed to be a problem for physicalism is the argument that when we uh, introspect or imagine or uh, uh, think about about experiences uh, in in the direct phenomenal way, we are having the nature of the experiences revealed to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to be frank, I don't think that's a very good argument. I mean, I, 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 I don't see why I should accept that, that uh, phenomenal thinking reveals, reveals the nature of, of its objects. Uh, mm -hmm. In truth, what's going on is a certain oscillation in V4. But when I, when I conjure up the experience in imagination, uh, it's not revealed to me that it's an oscillation in V4, even though it is. Uh, and I don't see why I should suppose that phenomenal thinking has this magical revelatory yeah. ability. In outside world, for example, uh, nature of objects are not revealed uh, So w when we experience them. So why should it be different when it is consciousness and not something other? It's kind of tempting. I mean, one, one thinks that, that uh, the, the, the mind is most closely connected with reality when we introspect our feelings. I mean, an awful lot of modern philosophy going back to Descartes uh, is built on the idea that somehow uh, introspection gives us direct access to at least one bit of reality, the conscious the conscious bit. But yes, I'm, I, 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 I agree. It's, uh, there's no reason to suppose that introspection works like this. And to be honest, it's rather, rather mysterious to see how it could. And this takes us back to the arguments for physicalism, which we haven't yeah. mentioned yet. Uh, and uh, 
Yes. I mean, the basic argument for physicalism, I mean, I'll make it very short and tie it up with what I've just been saying, is that if you're not a physicalist, you're going to be forced to be an epiphenomenalist about conscious mental states, that they somehow are there in reality but have no effects on the physical realm. And if that's right, it's very hard to see how introspection could be revealing the nature of some uh, non-physical conscious state because the non-physical conscious state wouldn't be able to affect our brains and to the extent that our thoughts and words uh, depend on what's going on in our brains uh, what we think and say about our experiences seems to be quite uninfluenced by the experiences themselves if you are a dualist because dualists get forced to be phenomenalism okay so so maybe that's a bit too many moving pieces let's just let's just focus on the positive argument for physicalism that if you're not a physicalist uh the 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 non-physical mental states are going to end up uh epiphenomenal causally quite impotent they have no effects in the rest of the world okay do you want me to give the argument i mean I, we, we've uh, uh um, I, I i've said kind of what the Mm -hmm. difficulty okay. for a non-physicalist is, but I haven't, mm -hmm. I haven't explained But it is not the argument, yeah. Uh, why why but, should they be uh, the, 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 the dualist has to be an epiphenomenalist. It's a conclusion of the argument. Yeah. If a dualist says, I mean, just to, to tidy up the, if a dualist says, okay, I'm an epiphenomenalist, then I've got no argument left. I mean, if you remember Frank Jackson, when he first put forward the knowledge argument, uh, it wasn't in the Mary paper. It was in a paper called Epiphenomenal. Epiphenomenal quality. Yeah. Epiphenomenal. I mean, he said that that uh, I've got a good argument that that uh, conscious mental states uh, must be non-physical. And um, okay, well, the consequence is going to be that they're epiphenomenal, but I don't care. Uh, I, that 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 shows me that uh, uh, we just have to grasp the nettle and accept that conscious mental states are epiphenomenal. Uh, To be honest, I mean, all right, so so let, let, let's just get, get clear. One thing we need to discuss is what's the argument that mm -hmm. comes to the conclusion that uh, if you're a dualist, conscious mental states are going to be epiphenomenal. Another question, which we're skirting around now, is how bad is that? Uh, is it intolerable uh, for a dualist to be forced to epiphenomenalism? And I think the answer is, is yes. And Frank Jackson has, has rather stopped being a dualist. He's given mm -hmm. up on the knowledge argument because he realized that epiphenomenalism really is a very unattractive position. And the most unattractive aspect of it is the thing that I mentioned a moment ago in, in the idea that phenomenal thinking is, is revelatory. Uh, if if uh, conscious mental states are epiphenomenal, like the puffs of smoke on a train that are caused mm -hmm. by what's going on in the brain but have no effects themselves, then in particular, they don't have any effects on people who are introspecting their mental states or trying to introspect their mental states. I mean, even if there weren't any mental states, everything that's going on in your brain would happen just the same. So the idea that somehow introspection is telling you about the nature of mental states starts to seem absurd i mean the mental states can't have any any uh any influence on on what you think um, mm -hmm. and so we also that, have actually uh, we also think uh, know that introspection is very follow uh, followable even uh, about mental states themselves right like good. beliefs and desires are uh, usually very uh, close to our uh, conscious access. So uh, why should they be uh, reliable for uncovering the ontological side of it? Right? Yes, good, good. I mean, so certainly when we think about our motives, our desires, we're very prone to confabulate and make up things. Uh, and I, I've actually, I don't know if I've written it up, but I, I gave a couple of talks saying that... that uh, even when it comes to 
conscious sensory states, the points at which uh, science is going to tell us uh, what our conscious state is like, and introspection won't be able to do it. I mean, there's issues in in perception about color perception and uh, uh, peripheral vision and so on, where introspection mm. is not very good at telling you what's going on in you consciously, and science is much better. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So about mind, uh, also, uh, we are not, uh, you have a causal argument for physicalism. Yeah. Quite, we, have, we haven't got to that yet. We, I, yeah, I, mean, yeah. the, the, I mean, I keep saying, if you're not a physicalist, you're yeah. going to have to view the mind as epiphenomenal. But I haven't told you why. Yeah. And, and there's nothing incoherent in a view that, doesn't view the mind as epiphenomenal. So take take Descartes' interactive dualism, or, or I mean, more modern versions of interactive dualism. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no immediate uh, abstract a priori knockdown argument against that. Look, I mean, here's a perfectly normal view that certain certain uh, uh, brain processes, uh, you know, I stick a in in you and uh, messages go up your nerves and it uh, uh, goes to your your brain, your C fibers activated and that then causes, okay, through the pineal gland or maybe kind of all over in the region of your brain, a uh, pain, which is separate from the neural processes and then the pain uh, influences downwards causation uh, uh, your motor cortex and and makes you makes you pull your arm away and I mean that's a a, a perfectly coherent coherent view that, that the part of the mechanism going from the pin sticking in to your moving arm away isn't just in your brain but in your in your conscious mind the brain produces effects in the conscious mind conscious mind might, might do a bit of a bit of uh, reasoning and reflecting and then produces effects in the brain, and in particular in the motor cortex, makes you move. That, that's a perfectly coherent, coherent view. And I think if we look at the, the history of modern science and philosophy since since 17th century you'll find that's been a dominant view. I mean, uh, scientists, physiologists, uh, philosophers, uh, give or take a bit, were all interactive dualists. So, I mean, well, when I say that, the philosophers tended to be to be idealists, but the uh, standard view in, in, in uh, physics and physiology was that among the the forces that influence the movements of matter were not just the forces you recognize now, but also a bunch of other, bunch of other forces, uh, forces of cohesion, chemical forces, and vital forces, forces that arose only in living bodies, and and uh, mental forces, uh, forces of of sensibility and irritability, and you know, in the in the eighteenth century, serious physiologists used to to argue about the nature of these nervous forces. Uh, so, uh, through the seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century, uh, the idea that that there was a, a a separate a separate mind that then influenced the physical world it was itself influenced by the physical world and it then influenced the physical world in turn was perfectly normal and acceptable and what changed, what changed is that modern physical science 20th century physical science came to the view that there aren't any special chemical forces, that uh, chemical bonding is all explained by uh, physical forces at the level of, of atoms. And there aren't any special vital forces that uh, uh, 
or uh, the the generation development of living bodies can happily be explained in in uh, physical chemical terms and there aren't any nervous forces either and i think mean, i think it was very late i think i think it was uh the explanation of actual potential in neurons by huxley and hodgkin in the 1950s that finally persuaded uh informed scientific common sense that that all physical effects should be explained in terms of the fundamental physical forces i.e gravity electromagnetism and and the nuclear forces and that's all we need so i think it's very late that we get the the, what's called the causal closure argument for physicalism. All, all uh, physical effects have physical causes, where physical is now understood just to mean uh, the, the four fundamental forces or something like that. Physical is understood to exclude uh, any special vital or mental forces. And it's, it's very late, uh, 20th century uh, discovery, and... Uh, and that's when all the philosophers started becoming physicalists in the 1950s. Uh, until then, it wasn't it wasn't a, a, a popular philosophical view at all. So it's it's the thought that all physical effects have physical causes that does all the work, and that's a, a very modern thought. And as you can see, that if you if if you think that, then there's no room left for mental causes to do do any work if they're mental causes they're going to be epiphenomenal because the physical the physical causes already produce the effects any any supposed extra non-physical things uh, aren't going to have aren't going to have any influence mm -hmm. that's that's the that's the view so um in that case for example you can just either reject causal closure or you should become an uh, inter interactive physicalist in that case, in interactive dualist in that case, or you should become an epiphenomenalist. Or, um, or, or just to... Just physicalist, yeah. Just, just to fill out all the options. Over determination. There is another position which is uh, sometimes called overdeterminationism. Yeah. That mm -hmm. uh, okay, every physical effect has a physical cause, but it also has a mental cause. Uh, mm -hmm. I heard my old Cambridge teacher Hugh Meller defend mm -hmm. this view, and I think he called it the belt and braces view, right? So, belt and braces uh, the joke you know, somebody's worried about their trousers falling down and they want to make doubly they wear a belt and they wear braces just to make sure they yeah. stay up. So the idea is you, you really want to make sure your hand comes out the fire. We'll have a physical cause uh, going entirely in your brain and a mental cause going via the, the consciously felt pain, which is separate, and we'll uh, have two causes for the effect. Okay, so let's we, we, can, we can do this in terms of four inconsistent premises or yeah. uh, I, I like to do it in terms of this. You've got... The causal closure of the physical, premise one. Mm. Uh, mental causes have physical effects sometimes. Uh, my feeling mm -hmm. of pain, so hand come out the fire. The physical effects of mental causes aren't all overdetermined. We don't have systematic overdetermination. And if you accept those three premises, then you have to be. Uh, physicalists because the second premise says uh, 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 physical effects have a mental cause the first premise says uh, physical effects have a physical cause the third premise says physical effects don't have two causes so uh, the two causes uh, the physical cause and the mental cause have to be the, the same cause yeah and you can avoid the physicalist conclusion either by denying the causal closure of the physical and being an interactionist 
or and now uh, we don't have any special further argument here but you could be an epiphenomenalist by saying mental causes don't have physical effects or you can be an overdeterminationist saying physical effects always have two causes i regard those two views as kind of silly they're positing yeah. weird metaphysical structures that we don't find anywhere else but but the other two interactionist dualism and physicalism are not silly they're nice straightforward mm -hmm. uh, causal hypotheses and i take it that that what knocks out interactionist dualism is just uh modern modern science in particular modern physiological science explanations of of uh, uh, nerve cells operating in in electro electrochemical terms. Uh, does this argument give us only a physicalism about mind or a very global physicalism? Do you think it gives us an argument for physicalism about anything that has physical effects? Yeah, and. I mean, that's kind of interesting. So everybody, right, unless you're going to end up as an epiphenomenalist, you want to have minds having physical effects because, you know, my decisions, my pains, my feelings uh, influence uh, what I do and so the movements of my body. Uh, it's not so obvious that anything goes too wrong immediately if... So what other things we had? Uh, 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 morality? Morality and meaning. And meaning, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So, which one should we start? Well, I, I just want to observe that that the causal closure argument doesn't immediately knock out uh, a non-physicalist view of morality. You might say that there are moral mm. facts uh, that are are uh, non-physical and okay they're non-physical so they can't have any physical effects so what's so bad about that who who thought mm -hmm. that moral effects went around causing things uh so you, so you might be a happy epiphenomist about about moral facts meaning facts much more complicated let's let, let's leave them to yeah. one yeah yeah to one to one side uh, look mathematics uh I'm. You know, I used to be a fictionist about mathematics. I'm mm -hmm. now half inclined to be uh, uh, a realist. Uh, and, uh, but of course, mathematical objects in themselves—you know, the number two, the, the real number pi—they don't have physical effects. They're they're in abstract uh, Plato space. But I don't think that's so terrible. Uh, so so it's 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 only an argument immediately against uh, being a dualist about facts that have physical effects. And mm -hmm. it doesn't give you an argument immediately against, say, say, mathematical facts, which nobody thought had physical effects in the first place. Uh, could we uh, talk about a little bit more uh, morality? Because uh, my viewers are usually, uh, I said before, uh, theists and Many of them believe that uh, moral uh, realism and naturalism are incompatible in some way or uh, other. So, especially most people think that uh, normativity creates a problem for naturalism, uh, e even in the meaning side of it. But we we leave it uh, late for later, I think. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of morality. Um, and moral normativity. Uh, for example, do you think norm, um, categorical imperatives like uh, compatible with uh, naturalism or uh, you, are, you believe in some weaker form of mor morality uh, that is more compatible with naturalism? It's not really my area and mm -hmm. I've scarcely written anything about this, but I do have views. But interestingly, I, I'm now quite a hardline moral realist. Uh, yeah, you, you were a non-cognitivist before, I think. Uh, quite so. So mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's there's two ways for naturalists to go on morality, and uh, one way is to go non-cognitivist to say there aren't really any moral facts they're just all the physical facts but we do have a lot of moral attitudes preferences attitudes of approval and disapproval and we have a discourse for expressing these attitudes and this discourse uh, uh, involves rational argument and disagreement and uh, is logically governed and the discourse proceeds very much like it would do if there were real moral facts and so we have some kind of projectivist quasi-realism but but on this view out there in reality there's nothing uh, moral at all there's just all uh, attitudes uh, whether you get any substantial normativity out of that, I look now. I so we don't want to at the beginning quibble about definitions and so on. Normativity is a term that that yeah. makes me very, <laughs> very uneasy. I'm never quite sure uh, what it's supposed to to mean. Uh, I mean, you mentioned categorical imperative, so this is some kind of truth that that is is because we don't want to put ought is going to bind any rational being I, I don't know quite uh, in virtue of the nature of rationality I mean that's kind of the Kantian ambition yeah. I think that I think that's that's too high a standard to set for for uh, substantial normativity. But I, I, I'm not quite sure what, 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 what normativity is. Yeah. But it, it, here's another way of being uh, respecting morality as a naturalist, which is to say that there really are moral facts out there in reality. They, they along with all the other facts, if you're a physicalist, are fixed by the physical facts, but uh, uh, that doesn't stop them stop them existing and being moral facts, and indeed uh, making it true that you ought not to kill, you ought to be kind, you ought to be fair. Uh, so, uh, and there's different ways of of running this, but but there's no principal reason why why a physicalist materialist can't hold that among the real facts that are grounded in the physical facts are some moral facts uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yes I mean here, here's here's a, here's a rather simple-minded way of of in the position. Suppose we just have a list of the good things, uh, you know, uh, uh, avoidance of pain, uh, avoidance of cruelty, uh, kindness, fairness, just a list, right? And those things mm -hmm. are good and valuable. That's what good and valuable means. Uh, and uh, But uh, sh uh, should we say that, for example, uh, goodness is somehow, should be preferred, right? Well, you want to put an extra bit of, but that's, I mean, th there's a sense in which, from the perspective, I'm, I mean, an objective list, uh, uh, moral realist, uh, that's just tautological. I mean, uh, good, should, ought, they all, they all just uh, repeating the same, same mm -hmm. notion. Uh, now, as it happens, most human beings are moved by these things. They they are moved by uh, uh, 
good things here. They're moved by the, they, they want things to be fair. They uh, are offended by cruelty and so on. Uh, but but there are other people who are just shits. I mean, they aren't nice people and they aren't so moved. And uh, the thought, but no, okay, there's some further authority uh, mm -hmm. which is going to lay down that you ought to be moved over and above human sentiment. That seems to me slightly crazy. I mean, uh, what's wrong? What's wrong with that idea? Well, uh, okay. Uh, for me, it's that there isn't any such authority. But mm. for someone who thinks there is some such authority, I would ask them, why... Why do they think it's good to be moved by the dictates of some other being rather mm -hmm. than Goodness your, itself. Your, own, your own sentiments rather mm -hmm. than your own appreciation that cruelty is a terrible thing and mm -hmm. and uh, flourishing is a good thing. Uh, uh, you're already moved by that if you're a normal human being. Uh, why? Why is that not enough? Why is that not enough to tell you yeah. what should be done? Why is it better to have somebody else telling you what should be done? That seems to me uh, uh, not 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 moving things in in any kind of progressive direction. I mean, th there's another thing here. Uh, I mean, you might say the view I'm putting forward is denying that there is any morality. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just, in the end, it's not that different from the the anti-realists, the people who said there's no moral mm -hmm. facts, just there's just human human sentiment. Uh, I mean, now I've put the moral facts into the world, but but the only thing that's that's uh, hooking them up with our uh, actions is human human sentiment and uh, uh, I think it's a bad thing to look for something more I think it's mm -hmm. a bad thing to feel that morality has some further authority than that but, mm -hmm. but imagine imagine two people or two communities to nations who are in some dispute about land or historic wrong or uh, what's owed or what should be done and and let's suppose that they're uh, initially reasonably well disposed and prepared to discuss and they point out that uh, uh, these people have lived there for a long time and uh, uh, if this happens it will be uh, uh, They'll lose all their livelihood, and uh, people will die, and so on. And uh, and suppose that they really can't resolve it on those grounds. And then one starts 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 saying, "And what's more, what you're proposing is wrong. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's it's against the moral law, right? And and to my mind, that's just not a helpful thing to say. I mean, when you've run out of pointing out how this is going to cause suffering and unfairness and cruelty and so on to start after that appealing to some higher authority that uh, seems to me uh, uh, a misbegotten idea and if, if that's what morality is I'm against morality and I'll say morality is a bad is a bad thing but uh, I'm not going to stop talking about yeah. what's good what people ought to do and so on uh, mm -hmm. And, and there, I just take my—I just take myself to be referring to, to natural facts like like uh, cruelty and fairness and so on. Another argument for uh, the claim that morality and naturalism are somehow incompatible is that, uh, and this will be connected to modality actually, mm -hmm. uh, that moral facts are actually necessary, but 
the universe and physical realm is contingent. So we can just, uh, the universe could have been uh, not, not around, right? So, but moral facts seems to be necessary, like uh, pain is ba uh, bad, for example. That kind of a moral fact seems necessary. So how could we ground such a necessary fact in a contingent universe, right? Interesting. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not obvious that all physical facts are contingent. contingent. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure this is really as serious. I mean, no, water equals H2O is necessarily water is H2O. Mm -hmm. In the universe, yeah. H2O, you'd have water. Uh, it's, I mean, truths about identity and constitution and so on are truths that we treat as necessary. necessary. Uh, so... Yeah. Uh, by the same coin, I I don't see why I shouldn't say that. Sure. I mean, this seems to me a good argument. I mean, there's debate about this, which 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 I'm not familiar with. Moral twin earth and so on. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I I I don't know this. Literally, I don't really know how the arguments go, but we imagine a world in which there's people who have, you know, they just have different elements. They're all in favor of uh, torturing other people's children, I don't know, and uh, uh, you know, they, they applaud you know, and that kind of thing. And, uh, and you might think well, in that world, morality, what's right and wrong would be different. But our, our reaction is no, these, these people are given to do mm. wrong things. But that's just to say that we use the term uh, right and wrong and ought to refer rigidly to what's right and wrong in, in our universe. And that seems fine, right? So, so I mean, on, on, on my... Yeah, I, I think all the naturalist accounts, I mean, my moral realist account, the various kinds of irrealist accounts, I think they can all they can all say that we use the words right and wrong across modal space in the way we use them here. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are your supposed uh, moral realists, anti-physicalist moral realists claiming that... Uh, Morality is necessary, a, a community that had... Uh, moral yeah. facts are necessary facts, but um, natural facts are all contingent. Okay, so, okay. What, what, but what's... No, I deny that natural facts are all contingent, mm -hmm. in particular that, that, that cruelty is uh, wrong. Facts about uh, also, like, uh, pain, pain is bad seems like... A counterfactual in the case that universe does not exist. For example, Sorry. no problem. Um, pain is bad. For example, seems like a counterfactual claim in the case that universe does not exist. Like, uh, if pain exists, it would be bad. We should we should say that not uh, that uh, there won't be anything bad about pain because if it exists, it, it is bad, right? Yeah, that's fine, but so, I, uh, I, I think this is why uh, the problem I, with I, I, I'm not yeah, seeing. Yeah. Okay, so, so so tell me, right? You're playing devil's advocate here, but tell mm. me how the objector is going to want to argue that for me, morality is contingent. Mm -hmm. But in truth, so, it's not. So for me, I ought to allow mm -hmm. that there's some possible world in which morality is different. Not, yeah. And and why? I mean, I can I can will allow that there's possible worlds in which people behave badly. 
but I mean, people behave in all kinds of ways. But but I why should I be forced to to, to say that uh, in that world what they're doing will be right? I don't want to say that at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, since you are a physicalist, you think that uh, moral facts uh, are also somehow connected to physical facts. But sure. uh, if physical facts are, for example, there might be no mind at all, right? So, um, or there might be no agents at all. In that case, which kind of physical fact would ground moral facts? Uh, so mere atoms or gases or planets seem not to do the work, right? So hang on. Uh... I'm not, we're getting slightly technical here. I'm not quite clear what moral fact needs to have physical grounding. That pain is bad, okay? Pain, I'm supposing, is a physical process. Maybe mm -hmm. everybody realized, maybe not. Let's, let's not worry too much about, about that. That it's bad. I don't think of this requiring extra physical grounding. We're getting into grounding the groundings here. So, like, pain is bad, I think of as akin to a square is a rectangle. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a, a determinant of a determinable. Mm -hmm. And so it's a kind of necessary truth. Um, mm, I see. Just, just like like that. And now, as such a necessary truth, it will hold across all possible worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's how. So, uh, what's your preferred account of uh, modality? I'm not very realist about modality mm -hmm. at all. Um, mm, yeah. There's, look, there's, there's logic, there's interesting debates about what's the nature of logic. I rather like a view that, uh, due to my old colleague, sadly died very young, Ian McFetteridge, that logic consists of those truths that we hold fixed in all reasoning of any kind. I mean, this view has recently been re revived by Ian, Ian Rumfit. Uh, and so logic is what we, what we have to go on assuming uh, in any kind of reasoning at all. Uh, mm -hmm. We hold fixed in all reasoning. Uh, there are Things that aren't logically necessary that we never would nevertheless regard as as necessary, like Marilyn Monroe is Norma Jean Baker. That's not a truth of logic, but we regard mm -hmm. it as a metaphysically necessary truth. And I think the, the metaphysically necessary truths are the ones we hold fixed in all counterfactual reasoning when we think mm -hmm. about how the world might have been different for figure, for purposes is the figuring out what we could cause to be different, who should be held responsibility, and so on. So, so there's a bunch of truths, the metaphysically necessary truths, which are the ones that we hold fixed in all counterfactual reasoning and reasoning of any kind. Are these metaphysical... And metaphysically necessary uh, facts somehow objectively metaphysically necessary or we should uh, see them as necessary? I, d I don't think there's any realm of moral truths out there yeah. somehow to which our moral discourse 
has to answer. I'm a projectivist about so modal discourse. I'm a projectivist about modal modal claims, modal statements. So uh, there. There's the actual world and the things we say about the actual world, mm -hmm. something true, something false. And then there's some of those claims are of a kind where we need to hold them fixed in all reasoning, and then we'll put necessarily in front of those those claims. Uh, there's mm, others, okay, I see. All reasoning, and then we'll put possibly in. Mm -hmm. Or possibly not in front of all those claims. Uh, I and, see. Uh, it, it, it seems like a constructivist uh, account, maybe in the metaethics, there's a constructivist tradition. Uh, some Kantian uh, constructivists say, say that all rational, uh, all rational agents should accept such and such uh, normative claims because all reasoning uh, assumes them somehow. And they seem to be trying to uh, construct mor morality out of that. So uh, your view about modality seems to be a constructivist view. In, in the meta in metaethics, there's a metaethical constructivism and yours is a model constructivist, I think. Sure, I'm, I'm a projectivist about, about mode. Modality, but uh, you also want to retain some objectivity uh, there, yeah. Yes, but so what's giving me pause is, is is that when you made the analogy with with the Kantian constructivist, yeah, you brought in normativity. Mm -hmm. It's not clear to me. Uh, what is it? Yeah. And, and in particular, how, how it relates to these issues about modality. Uh, mm -hmm. I see. I see. So, okay. yes. Uh, normativity of, of meaning, uh, I'm rather impatient with. I, I, I think in the realm of... Of meaning, what drives our norms is the instrumental norms for reaching, reaching mm. the truth. And then there's a question about why do we want to reach the truth? And you might feel this was a some kind of categorical imperative or not. But but I, whichever way you go on that, I I I, I think the norms the norms of of uh, Of thinking and speaking are oriented towards the end of truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in the case of meaning, then there's normativity, but uh, not inherent in somehow uh, meanings of words, but uh, instrumentally uh, normative in a way. Yes, th there's a big division in thinking about meaning. Which is, and this is kind of Dummett's terminology uh, between. I'm hesitating to use these terms because they're not necessarily used the same way as in other areas, but between uh, realist and anti realist approaches to, to meaning and normativity of thought. And mm -hmm. one, is, one is that what comes first are rules for using words and uh, concepts and and the content is breathed into the words and other other uh, units of thought by the rules for using them correctly and what it is to judge truly is to judge in accord with the rules and uh, I think that's all completely back to front. I, I, I think that what comes first are uh, 
quite independently of the way people use words, uh, naturalistic relations between the words and items in the world and between sentences and truth conditions. And once you've got those fixed, then there's a derivative fact that if you reason in certain ways uh, with, with certain words, you'll end up speaking or thinking truly. And if you don't, you won't. And uh, to the extent you want to speak and think truly, you should reason in the first way. So the question is, which comes, which comes first? Uh, uh, rationality, uh, reasoning in line with certain rules, or, or truth? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you explain truth in terms of rationality? Do you explain rationality in terms of truth? And I'm very much in the latter, latter mm -hmm. camp. So, I, so I, 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 I have no difficulty in accounting for the normativity of, of meaning, of rule following, and so on, uh, all as a hypothetical imperative that if you want the truth, these are the ways mm -hmm. you ought to reason. And once, once, once you think of the normativity of meaning in this way, all, all the, 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 the a whole range of problems that face the other approach fall away. I mean, all, all the, the rule following considerations, normativity of meaning are, are the problems that arise when you think that somehow uh, uh, content is breathed into your words by rules for using them. And then suddenly you've got a question about what's the nature of these rules and what's their authority and uh, 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 how do we know if we're conforming to them and so on. All those problems just go away if you think about, about the normative, normativity of meaning the other way around. I see. So we have some audience questions um, for at least 15 minutes, I think. Sure. Uh, did you think about fine-tuning argument before? Uh, or do you, do you think that it is a challenge to physicalism or naturalism? Yes, yes, I do think it's a challenge. Uh, and I think uh, it's a very interesting uh, argument. And uh, we can... So everybody knows that uh, a lot of the concepts yeah. of nature seem to be just right for the emergence of... Of life, you know, if the constant of gravitation was a bit stronger, if all kinds of constants were a bit different, uh, 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 the universe wouldn't have evolved. We'd just be a one great big uh, clump of matter. There wouldn't be any suns. Uh, uh, we're very lucky. Okay, uh, it seems we're very lucky to be here. And uh, and what's the options? Uh, one is, okay, yeah, we're very lucky to be here. Uh, second is, then it's not a matter of luck at all. Uh, uh, an all-powerful being created uh, the universe just like that so that uh, it could be interesting and people could evolve. And the third option, which is the one I favor, is that there are many, many, many real universes, and it's not surprising. All, most of them with very uh, uh, life-unfriendly constants of nature and it's not surprising that the one we find ourselves in is uh, one with my friendly constants of nature. So I think it's a good argument for uh, multiple universes. Yeah, uh, I see it in that way as well, because uh, some people interestingly think that it's an argument for God. It increases the yeah, probability it, it, of it, God's it, existence, but not in favor of multiverses. Like, what is different in these inferences? Because they seem to be uh, very much the same kind. And also, different universes seem like more fami familiar kind of entities, right, uh, than God. So uh, I, I think, okay. I Go back to the first option. Now, what's to explain? We're just lucky. Uh, uh, I think there is something to explain. There's a very fine article by Derek Parfit, long article. It's not an article. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a three-part. Why anything? Why this? I think uh, in the London Review of Books uh, yeah. about 25 years ago. Uh, uh, I actually went to, and heard him give the lectures. I mean, very very nice analysis. And he says, look, there is something to explain. I mean, if <coughs> if Joe Bloggs wins the lottery, uh, 
well, um, you know, somebody's going to win the lottery. If the lottery owner's daughter wins the lottery, this looks like something that calls for explanation. And and mm. Robert says that that uh, uh, finding ourselves in life friendly universe is rather like the lottery owner's daughter winning the lottery. And now, okay, now now we need an explanation. And here's two explanations. One is God designed the universe. The other is that there are multiple universes. And, and those are both good explanations. And so if you want to infer to the best explanation, you should infer to one of them. And then there's the question, which of those is the best explanation? And many people think that uh, that if there were not Mrs. Universe uh, being designing the universe, uh, she would have done a much better job than has actually been done and would have avoided all the evil there is. And so that's an argument for supposing the multiverse explanation is the better one. But now you mention it, there are people. Yeah. And I think, I'm thinking of Philip Goff in particular, mm -hmm. who want to say, Yes, the fine-tuning does call for explanation. They don't want to just dismiss it as, well, something had to happen. But then want to say that the theistic explanation is a good explanation and the multiverse explanation is not. And I don't think that they can make a good case. We, we get into a lot of messy arguments about Bayesianism and probabilities. Yeah, and yeah. But, but without going into those, on, on the face of it, it seems that... that First question is, is this something that cries out for explanation? And if it is, it's hard to see why these aren't two serious explanations. I see. So, um, another question. Oh. Oh. I see, yeah. So, um, this question is interesting. Does methodological naturalism entail or make probable metaphysical naturalism? If yes, can a non-physicalist be naturalist? If we think phenomenal consciousness as subjective. So can you put the question back so I can keep looking at it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, your but, face is closed, so I... Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll sit yeah, up. That would be better. Yeah. So we can see the question. Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, so imagine that I'm just trying to think what would be good evidence. Well, and Uh, imagine that the, the detailed investigation of the workings of the human mind, other animal minds, showed us that uh, there really was a nervous force field. That, say, the in the brain, kinetic energy disappeared and wasn't stored in the potential energy of any uh, uh, electromagnetic fields. And, uh, and then later on, it reappeared in the form of, of molecular motion. Uh, that would be a knockdown. I mean, knockdown is a bit strong, but that, that would be a good yeah. scientific argument for, for a non-physical mind. And, and that's what they thought in the 19th century. They thought that... Uh, Nervous energy, the phrase nervous energy was uh, uh, the energy of the nervous force field. They thought that uh, when you say somebody's full of nervous energy, they were thinking of the nervous energy as the potential of the, the, the nervous force field, which uh, was getting stored up like an electrical spring while you'd liberated and were getting ready to act. And then the moment for action came and you released it in the form of the kinetic energy of the movement of your limbs. Uh, so that would be a good naturalist argument for, for methodological naturalist argument for metaphysical non-physicalism. I mean, I, I also mentioned earlier the, 
the argument for design, uh, the Paley's argument from design. Look, here, here's, here's all these features of life on Earth, which are manifestly well designed for the environment. Uh, uh, how could that be unless there was some some supernatural being who designed designed life on Earth? That, that strikes me as another uh, mythologically mm -hmm. natural argument for non-physicalism. So, I mean, there may be some aspects, just looking at the last bit of the question, of, of consciousness that, that is not scientifically tractable, but it's not... It's not obvious what, but if you're just thinking of of uh, elements of reality beyond those recognised by contemporary physical science, well, of course, methodological naturalism could have taken us there if the facts were different, if the evidence was different. Yeah, I see. So, um, in the case of so, we should say that in the case of today's. Uh, the evidence we have right now seems to imply metaphysical naturalism, but uh, if the, if it was different, like if you uh, saw a nervous field like mm -hmm. you described, it would be evidence against naturalism. Uh, it would be a um, methodologically naturalist argument against metaphysical naturalism. Yeah, yeah. So this is reminding me can't remember if it was Quine or somebody, logical positivist, verificationist theory of meaning, and somebody said, the trouble with you, you logical positivists, is, is, is you rule out religion as, as unverifiable from the start. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, no, not at all. Absolutely, it'd be verifiable. I mean, if an angel walked through the door right now, <laughs> yeah. my, my atheism would be refuted straight away. And uh, it's, it's just a, a lack, lack, of, lack of evidence. Uh, so... It's, I mean, there are people uh, moved by the, the standard arguments against physicism from consciousness, the knowledge mm -hmm. argument, the theory argument, the zombie argument, and so on. Uh, well, I mean, there's various ways of, of avoiding epiphenomenalism, and perhaps the most popular one is some kind of Vasilian, funny... Uh, 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 monism, but there are others who say, "No, no, hang on. Who, who, who said we have to accept the causal closure of the physical?" And uh, you can see quite a lot of people. I have a research student at the moment saying, "Look, is is this neurophysiological evidence so compelling that there aren't some extra non-physical causes in the brain?" You know, you keep on citing uh, Huxley and Hodgkin, but I mean, we haven't. We really don't understand every movement of every molecule in the brain there might there might be all kinds of things going on uh philip goff has recently had a debate with sean carroll on his and keith frankish's keith, keith frankish's philip goff and keith frankish's podcast they debated with with sean carroll the the, the physicist philosopher of physics about whether a nervous force field would make any real scientific sense and uh you know, yeah started off saying look the, the the evidence against isn't compelling how do we know everything that's operating in the brain and carol came back and said look there'd be a problem here because of the kind of continuity that we expect uh, physical force fields to have that uh they have to be present yeah. in the very small as the large. Are they just suddenly going to appear out of nothing once you get a brain that looks wrong? And so, so I mean, th th this is all methodologically naturalist serious argument yeah. about about could there be some extra uh, uh, causal influences in the world over and above physical ones? So, so nice. yeah. Uh, the name of the podcast is Mind Chat, I think. Uh, Exactly. Yeah, so uh, our viewers might uh, see the episode themselves. Good. So uh, we discussed, uh, we might discuss one other question and close the live stream. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tolson said, is reductive physicalism incompatible with mor moral realism? I mean, should they be non-reductive physicalists for being moral realists? Do you think that? 
Because there's two kinds of moral realism, as I understand it. I said this is not my area. You know, I don't really write it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I am interested. I'm very happy to to hold forth yeah. about it. And uh, so there's the Cornell moral realists who mm. who say, look, there are moral facts out there in reality, and they have causes and effects, but they're not reducible to the physical realm. It's a bit like functionalism in the philosophy of mind mm -hmm. mental states are variably realized uh, don't look for any equation of of uh, mental states with physical brain processes martians computers can be in pain but they're very different physical non-reductive physicalism and cornell realists are a bit like that about moral facts that there really are moral facts out there but they're kind of variably realized don't try and look for any particular physical realization but I think there's a more flat-footed kind of moral realism, which I don't see myself any, any problem with, which is just to equate what's good and valuable with uh, a list of things like avoidance of pain and fairness and kindness and uh, avoidance of cruelty and so on. That's, that would be a kind of reductive moral realism it would only reduce be reducing uh, 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 moral facts to to facts like pain and fairness and you might have further views about whether pain was uh, reductive uh, reducing to physics but but I, I take it that wasn't the thrust of the question the question was could you be uh, uh, a flat-footed reductionist about moral goodness uh, and mm -hmm. that position uh, Hang together, and I don't see, I don't see why, why it shouldn't myself. Mm -hmm. I see. So um, we have another question about intentionality, but it would be very long, uh, a very long conversation, I think. So I maybe understand. in the future we might uh, discuss intentionality separate from naturalism and others. Like maybe we can dive into uh, teleo semantics. So um, I would greatly appreciate it too. Um, yeah. I'd, be I'd be glad to come back and talk about telesemantics, subject close to mine. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So uh, th thanks again for joining us today. Uh, if you have any, th any uh, things to say to our viewers, uh, we, we can then uh, end the live stream. Uh, nothing springs to mind. Thank you for coming and listening. Uh, I would be very happy to come back again and talk some more, so maybe we can talk talk more then. Thanks a lot, Professor Papinov. Uh, see you later, and see you later our, uh, to our viewers as well. Thank you, Barak. Glad to be here. That was fun. Bye.